pray. Lord Jesus, when we leave this morning, we can say our hearts burn within us because he has spoke to us along the way. We thank thee for this grand opportunity that has, been, has come our way. We could assemble here with these people, thy children, and enjoy this moments of fellowship. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that your blessings will rest upon us as we journey in different places, lead others. We thank thee for every testimony of this fine uh, Christian atmosphere here this morning and for all these uh, ones that's been a long time in the way and for this young man just crossed over Jordan to see what it really means to live. We can all appreciate that, Lord, of knowing at one time we were on the other side too, but no more of the old life now. It's, it's only it's back in Egypt. Uh, we pray that you'll bless our fellowship together as we read thy word and speak a few words from this great word of God that we all believe in, and bless it to our hearts now to continue the service. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask it. Amen. Brother Leo, Brother Gene, and pilgrims, I, I deem this uh, one of the grand uh, privileges that I've had to come here to see for myself uh, what you have here on these grounds. It's, um, I have been blessed as I moved across the little creek there and see this court, and I, one time when Brother Leo was making tapes, and I told him that surely there was something greater in life for him than to make tapes. And of course, tape making is something we must do, but it's blessed us. But uh, there's something else. We're all cut out for different things to do. And to come here this morning and look at this fine little uh, Jerusalem sitting out here, a little, what I called it Goshen, I believe, when we uh, come over this morning. Remember, Goshen was one of the places that they worshiped, one of the first places the ship was pitched. And to meet old friends and, and new. And to have this time allotted to us. I just, it seems like it, that you just don't want to leave. It's just something that wants to hold you. I can see why you people would, would want to stay here. It's something that grips you. I don't believe I was ever in uh, any sweeter uh, worship and fellowship as these songs and things that I sit there and bite my lips and shake my feet and try to hold myself back from screaming out when I hear those old songs sing in the way that I think they ought to be sung. And that's sung in the Spirit. Uh, that's uh, what we, we, Paul said, if I sing, I'll sing in the Spirit. Uh, I can't imagine the Spirit as being screaming to the top of her voice. I, I think the Spirit of Christ is love and gentleness and peace. And it brings something to our souls that feed us. And I think that, that's the way them songs should be sang. And to be here with you, the, a dedicated people to a cause, the cause of Christ. There's just so many things that I could, could say that the time wouldn't permit me. I, I come for... I uh, thought, well, I'll run up and visit Brother Leo in the church up there and the uh, portion of the body of Christ that's waiting for the for his coming and a uh, part of the bride that's uh, sojourning here and how you've separated yourself from the rest of the world and, and come over here to, to live this way. I was thinking even the little creek you're on this side of Jordan. <laughs> you're, you're in the, the land. You're, you're, you've come over an exodus. Uh, coming out of the world into a place to where you can congregate yourself together and, and worship God uh, uh, really according to the dictates of your conscience. And that's what uh, we stand for as a democracy, as a nation. We stand for this very thing that each man can worship. And it's just too bad we don't have more like this. That's right. Or that, that the world be in their place and uh, God's people be in their place where we can have this. And I certainly have. If, if I said amen and walked out the door, I'd say it would pay me every Sunday to drive up here or have my children even to come up to, to sit under an atmosphere like this because it's always the atmosphere that brings the results. You can lay a seat out there in the ground 
No matter how much that seed germatized and lay it there, it's got to have an atmosphere to make it live. See, that sun has to come to a certain point before bring it to a certain atmosphere. An egg has to have an atmosphere or it won't hatch. No matter how fertile it is, it's got to have that atmosphere. And I think that in a group like this, Christians hatch out or born again uh, in such an atmosphere. This is the kind of atmosphere I was born under. No matter where I go and visit the cold world and mission fields and so forth, I can even stand and close my eyes and think of this atmosphere. This reminds me when I was just a boy preacher and just starting out. We had little groups to meet from house to house. We separated ourselves from the things of the world, too. That's what made my heart the way it is today, in love with Christ. Where we can dwell together, I'll be, the scripture said, how sweet it is that brethren can dwell together in unity. It's like the anointing oil was on Aaron's beard that ran to the hems of his garments. And this is so much to be said. I, I, maybe the Holy Spirit will interpret to you after I'm gone what uh, it is. Wish I could stay all afternoon and just forsake meals and everything else. Just sit here and hear you sing. See, hear you sing and talk and testify. It means so much. My daughter graduates tonight, or sits the back of life service tonight, and I have to hurry back. And I uh, didn't know that it was to be this uh, back of life service was to be. So just last night, <laughs> I'm kind of busy and don't notice it. And visiting with Brother Leo and Brother Gene as you come down. Uh, I long for the time to be here, wondering, just really, I heard people say, well, they got a lovely trailer court, they're over on one side, the world's on the other, and on this side's all dedicated lives and things. I thought, I'd like to see that. I'd just, just like to see what it really is. And you are blessed to be here. I, I want to read just one verse out of the Bible. And I think just reading this one verse would absolutely make a complete service. But it, I have, coming up here, I had just a few comments that I thought I would say. It won't take me but just a few minutes. And then I would like to say these comments to what I, what I feel now. In the book of Second Corinthians, the 12th chapter and the 11th verse, I would like to read this. Paul speaking, I have become a fool in glory, yea, compelling me, for I ought to have been com commanded of you. For in nothing am I behind the very cheapest apostles, though I be nothing. I would like just, if I would call this a text, uh, I think the Holy Spirit is just among us. And we, it wouldn't be just to read a scripture. He, that's what he lives on. And every word is given by inspiration. And it's fitting for time. It never ends. It's like a chain. It just keeps going on. It never ends the scripture. And I thought... Uh, while reading this and thinking of this little place up here, this come on my mind. Paul saying, I have become a fool. See? Now, that's a, a very strange thing for an apostle to say. I have become a fool. Now, a fool is a person that really isn't in their right mind. And how would this apostle say such a thing as this? I become a fool. And then thinking of, of this group, no doubt that in the eyes of the people on the other side, you've become a fool. You have become what we would call today the oddball. No doubt what people think that of you. And remember that on the other side, they're oddballs too. See? So, uh, so you have to be somebody's fool. So I'd rather be a fool for Christ. See? I'd be a, God said his people were a peculiar people. Odd. A chosen, elected, a royal priesthood, uh, offering spiritual sacrifices to God, that is the fruits of our lips, giving praise to His name. Some time ago, this little sense of humor, and I hope it doesn't break the fine spirit that's in here, just come on my mind. It was a brother Troy, uh, the full gospel businessman, was telling about uh, this, uh, I was thinking of this for this young singer here that just come to the Lord. Uh, when he uh, he was working in a he's a meat cutter and he was working in a butcher shop and and um, this is a German there and he just kept talking to him about the Lord and this uh, German couldn't talk English very well so he he said uh, well come on to the meeting he said 
you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So the old Dutchman in the morning would know that he was a loser. You see, he was a, he was all right. He was a loser. He said, "Well, you come on up and visit us once." And so they come across to a, a bunch of perhaps uh, uh, oddballs, too, as we call it, to see. That night, this German uh, man received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and the next day he was cutting meat and speaking in tongues and screaming. He was having him a regular jubilee, and so. Well, after a while, the boss of the factory come by and he said, Henry, said, what's the matter with you? He said, oh, glory to God. He said, I got saved. <laughs> and he said, uh, why? Well, he said, well, where have you been? He said, you must have been down there with that bunch of nuts, he said. He said, yes, glory to God. He said, I, I was down there with a bunch of nuts. He said, you know, if you didn't have the, the, the nuts, that you take like the automobile. It comes down the road. And you take all the nuts out of it, you, what you got? But a bunch of yunk. <laughs> That's just about right. And um, you uh, take uh, the, the, the nuts out of anything. Now, uh, it takes that to hold the thing together. The world gets in such a, a place and a turmoil. And the church gets sold, uh, sold up in moralism and, and denominationalism and so forth till it takes some time enough to hold the thing together. And that's right. If we don't have it, we don't have it. We don't have the church. Now, we can think of that subject just for a few moments. Paul said, I have become a fool or a, a nut. Just for, now, you have to be somebody's nut. You can either be a nut for the world or a nut for Christ. One day in California, he was walking down the street, and there was a man. He had a sign in the front of him, and I just said, I am a fool for Christ. And on his back, he had a sign that said, now, whose fool are you? <laughs> so there's a question mark. So you have to be somebody's fool. So Paul here had chosen to be a fool for Christ. And you can imagine how the world thought of him at that time, and not only the world, but the church. That man had been trained to be a priest. He was trained under Gamaliel. A great, one of the greatest scholars and greatest teachers of that day. And when he had maybe, say, his Bachelor of Art and his, his doctor's degree and, and was ready for uh, to be called into the priesthood, and maybe someday with the possibilities, with the enthusiasm this young man had, and then to change that all at once, all because something happened, he met Christ on the road to Damascus. And then to the world, he was a fool. And to the church... He was a fool. To the, the denominational church, he was actually a fool. That's what he said here. He had become a fool. He's a fool to those people. But he was uh, the instrument that God used to hold the church together, to hold the body, as it was in that day, together. He had become a fool for that, for that sake. We can imagine of Noah, as uh, the brothers sang of him here, uh, uh, while God sent his love on the wings of a dove, one of my favorite songs. And um, I always wanted to get somebody that could play that. I wanted to speak on it. One time I read a story of some uh, soldiers being pinned down. And um, the enemy, Germans in the First World War, had them pinned down. And uh, they uh, had a, a little pigeon to take a message. And when the, that's a form of a dove, of course, just one variety of dove. And when they put the message on the little a uh, pigeon, he flew up in the air and bullets shooting at him every way because they know what it was. It broke his legs. His little legs was hanging down, crippled. And his wings had the feathers shot out of it. He was turning sideways and everything through the air. But he drops right in the camp where he was supposed to be. And they got help. You know what I mean from there on. And so, we were in that kind of shape one day too, you know. And then, uh, he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquity, but the message got here just the same. He got the message to us. And Noah, in his days, I can imagine a man of his caliber, a prophet, that was uh, vindicated of God. And, and God spoke to him one day. What a strange thing it was in a great scientific age. Perhaps could shoot the moon with a radar and they could build a sphinx in the pyramid. And, and God spoke to him and said, Noah... It's going to rain water down out of heaven. Could you imagine a man of his caliber, a prophet of the Lord, go out with such a silly message as that? And say, there had never rained, remember, from the heavens in them days. God watered the earth, the Bible says, by irrigation through the ditches and so forth, springs. It had never rained a drop. There was no water up there. So they could prove there was no water up there. 
And then a man come out with a message, and not only that, but separated himself from the rest of the world. He become a nut to the world. That's right. He was a nut of his age. How a man with such a crazy message would try to bring a people out into a little trailer or an ark or whatever it was they, they were building up there, and he was, a, he was actually a, a foolish man. But what did he do? In doing so, he was the nut that saved the believing church in that day. That's what happened. He had to take him out from the world. But he was preparing a place that he knew that Christ could come to and would take them. He would come a nut. You could you imagine Moses in his day? A man going down to a great intellectual. They conquered the world at that time. And their scientific and their... Their art and stuff really, I guess, exceeded ours today. And their master art and their mastership of buildings and so forth and the great things that they did down in, in that day. And could you imagine a man coming down there and said he met a, a God that they didn't even believe in in a burning bush. And he came down uh, being a military man to begin with and had been trained in all the maneuvers of of, of, of military uh, world, and we find that he comes down there with a stick in his hand to take and deliver a people out of a nation that ha helped the world captive. Why, to Pharaoh, he was a nut, that's all. He was crazy, he said, let him do it. go ahead, rave on. He'll declare himself insane. Well, I really, to Pharaoh in his great scientific world, he was a oddball. He was a, a, a nut to, to them to see. He was. But what did he do? He delivered the people because he was sent of God. It, took, it takes something peculiar, something that's different from the rest of the world. And saying the world is so one way on the great, their great scientific achievements and so forth. And when a man is led of God to do something that's odd to that, he becomes a fool. He's crazy. But see, it takes something like that to hold the thing together. Now, we think of Elijah in his days, when Ahab and Israel at that time had every nation under heaven spearing them under this Ahab's reign. And Ahab was a great man. It was a great day, something on the order we have now. The church had all become fashion. The, it was uh, Jezebel's paint and, and uh, Ahab's worldliness and compromising, and they tore down the orders of God. Oh, just so you serve a God, what difference does it make? See, we go to the groves and you can serve any gods you want to. That's just about the way it is today. See, all fashions and, and, and dressings and clothing and things of the world. And, oh, if you want to belong to this, belong to that, belong to this, belong to that. It's all right. See, just as long as you go to church, it doesn't make any difference. It does make a difference. What I, what I belong to and what God I serve and how I serve him, he's got one way to me serving. He's got that road out here in this world. Amen. And that's the way we're to serve him, see. Now, it does make a difference. But when Elijah came out there with such a message as he had, could you imagine he became a nut to, to, to Pharaoh, or to, uh, pardon me, to Ahab? He became a regular uh, separating himself. But you see, there was 7,000 among those people, see, that could be saved, see? And he came for them. He had to become a nut to the world in order to catch them. So did Noah had to become a nut to the world to catch eight souls with himself, see? He had to become an odd sort of, of a person. Amos, in the days when he brought his message, he prophesied. And uh, we find out that when he come into to, to Samaria, which had been given over to the world and the women in the streets had become almost public prostitution and their fashions, it was a modern Hollywood. When this little uh, unknown... A uh, bald-headed fellow raised up over the mountain one morning and looked down upon uh, Samaria and saw it in sin, and why, well, I'd imagine his heart almost failed. Only thing he had known, he'd been a herdsman. He, he wasn't really the Lord just giving this message and sitting down there. And, but now he had no sponsorship. He had, he had nobody to back him up, but he was led of God to go bring this message to the people and to call them out from judgment. Well, now, I'd imagine to the great scientific age and the age of glamour, something or other today, Amos became a, a, a oddball. 
and he became a fool. And uh, they, they wouldn't want nothing to do, but yet he had done the the Lord, see? And he delivered what could be delivered. John the Baptist, when he came in his days, that great religious world, coming out in of uh, the wilderness like this, out of rocks and things in the, in the wilderness of Judea. And um, he wasn't dressed like a priest. He, he wore the rough clothes uh, of a working man, perhaps, with a, uh, a garment around him, not some great theological seminary uh, teacher or some forth. But he, he was just a common man. I could work with his hands or anything. When he, when he came down out of the, the wilderness there and the sheepskin wrapped around him, he had thus said the Lord. For he knew that the time of the Messiah was in. He could thoroughly identify himself in God's word. He said, for remember, he identified himself in Malachi, the third chapter, the, uh, uh, the messenger to forerun the coming of the Lord. He knew the coming was the close until he, he had to come out. Well, the people thought he was a wild man, just a, 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 a fool, see, a nut, we'd call it today. The reason I chose that word nut, it sounds flat, but yet it, it's a good word for what I want to use it for, because that's the way the street expression would, would use it today, just a, a common nut, we'd call it. Well, here is John the Baptist. It's just simply staying out there in that wilderness, preaching those little sermons right down there on the, on the Jordan, walking up down that banks of the river, crying, the, the hours at hand, come out and separate yourself, the Messiah's coming. Well, I'd imagine the priest and all him, he'd become just a regular nut, that's all. See, that's, that's all he was, just an oddball. And then I thought he'd become oddballs, just simply fools. Do you know our Lord was declared the same thing when he come? A madman, see? He didn't go over into the cities and, and into a great uh, adjoining, there were the great organizations and things. He was calling a people. He was calling on and he was considered by the religious his days a regular nut. Just like Paul was in his days, a trained man. And yet would, would do such a thing as he did, separate himself from the rest of the world and from the denominations and, and try to call a people. He was an apostle to the Gentile church. He is our apostle. We, we know that to the Gentile church. He was the nut that brought the Gentile church out of Roman heathenism and pagan worships of the day. Martin Luther, he was a nut to the Catholic church. See? Could you imagine a priest that, 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 that throws uh, all these teachings away in, uh, of, of the church and refuse to give this communion because the church said it is the body of Christ, and he knew he, the, the nuns and them had made that kosher up in there. He, he knew that wasn't Christ as a piece of bread, see, a little sugar wafer. And he knew that, that that wine was no literal blood of Christ, and only represented it. So he, he, he threw it down, and, and his, his honest conviction, and he wanted nothing more to do with it. See, he, he, he was through with it. Now, the probably Catholic Church said, oh, let him alone. Look what a, a little group he's got out there. What is it he's got? Just a all fall from a big church. That's all it is. It's just the thing. But you see, he was the nut. See? That was holding it together. See? In the Reformation, he brought forth the Reformation. How about after he organized and got to a place and, and uh, after his death and uh, the message that he preached had finished, then the uh, church got so cold and starchy again, so God raised up another nut. <laughs> Called John Wesley. That's right. Well, he was enough to the Anglican Church. See? But what did he do? He, he saved the world. The world, the church that was in the world, may I say. He saved the church that was in the world. Why? By becoming a nut. That's right. He saved. Well, and now, then we call after his career and the great Wesleyan age passed over, and then we had uh, uh, the Baptist from John Smith, and then we had Alexander Campbell, and, and then we had Buddy Robinson of the Nazarene, and finally it just kept waving off away from the real stem, and then God raised up another bunch of nuts, <laughs> Pentecost, <laughs> and they become a, a nut to the people. They're crazy to the world. But what did they do? They did a great work. They certainly did, the Pentecostal age. Now... Now, 
I believe it's time for another nest to raise. Do you think so? Uh, I think it's just about Pentecost has done the same thing that that uh, the rest of the world went. But it's time for another nut. See? So if we have completely on this side of the brain, you see what I mean? And the people think that we're so odd and peculiar, the way we separate ourselves, the way you have here, and we're we're not divided, we're one. See? The way that we are, we separated ourselves from the world. Brother Leo led to come up here, and there was you had little children, it has to be trained up. See, you got women, young ladies here that, that don't like to walk in the way of the world. You got men here that's aged and retired. They want a place to where they can settle down and feel at home. You uh, dwell among your own kind of people, but. See, I think that God can raise up something to take care of that. Don't you think so? I, I believe that with all my heart. And he does that. Now, we find out, it's time now. Notice, uh, the nut always was what pulled them together. Like all uh, Americans today, we find so much worldlyism and things in the, our churches and our denominations and things. Let something raise up on the Word. See, they got off to the creed and not the Word. And let something raise up with the word. You know, you say, well, the people think you separate yourself. I talked to your pastor here and our brother Leo, and someone said, well, why don't you come and, and come into this and come in that? He said, no, no. See, he, he sold out the one thing, the word, and to the word. See, well, now look, if there is a nut sent, there's got to be a bull for it to sit on. Amen. <laughs> <You know that? laughs> Now, God sends nuts. Don't you believe that? Yeah. It's an, I, I, I explain this in a little bit, but to make this up. There's got to be a bolt, and that bolt got to be threaded to fit the nuts. Yeah. I'm so glad to be threaded with the Word. I'm so glad that there's a bolt that's threaded the same way. Yeah. What's it to do? It's to draw out the bride from the world, set it aside for something different. Yes, friend. We may be a nut to the things of the world, the people of the world, but we are only drawing out that which is threaded for this. Noah was threaded in his day. And the rest of the prophets and down to the age and the righteous man was threaded because he sent it what would be used to having a bolt a nut if he didn't have a bolt for it to go on. And what is the bolt and the nut together to do? It's draw something together. Amen. It's the drawing powers of Christ that draws us out from the things of the world. See? And then we fellowship with Paul, the great ministry, saying, I have become a fool. So when people think that you are odd, see? See where you stand? See? You've become a fool to them that you might be drawn by the power of God to which something was in you. Something in your heart threads you. I might say this morning, who is Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, Assemblies, this, that, and the other. There'd be all kinds of hands go up here, 40, 50 people. See? There would be that many, uh, everybody different. But what makes you sit here? Why are you here? See? It's because you were threaded to something. See? And when it begins to come, it makes sense to you. If you try to put a certain thread upon a, a bolt with a certain kind that wouldn't fit, it doesn't make sense to you. See, it, it won't go on. See? But when something comes along that fits just exactly, it pulls you from Chicago, from New Orleans, or wherever you come from, to here. See? And now, you, see, you become an oddball sure enough to the world. But don't let that bother you. See? Don't let that bother you. Now you see, how on the one threaded right, watch the word. See? Now you know where you're threaded right, whether we are next for Christ or whether we are that's for the world. Now the world also has received their, uh, their nut. Exactly. I had a little something go down here I didn't want to forget. The, the, and we said here become bolts, uh, nuts to the world. That's exactly that we might hold the kingdom of God together on earth. The kingdom of God together. All right. Remember the world, they, they, the outside world, they have their nuts also. Satan gives them a nut. In the days of this great thing, you see, it all works at pro and con. See? Now, in the days of the world had enough, and that was Pharaoh. In the days of uh, 
of Moses. The world, see, they had to be, the, the devil has his nuts too. Well, that was Pharaoh, see, now Israel and Moses, and I was to draw those people out was a nut to Pharaoh, but also Pharaoh was a nut to them too, see, and so it has to be that way. So you're somebody's nut. I'm so glad to be wound in the word, aren't you? With, with the thread of that. Somebody would teach that Ahab. He was a, a nut. Exactly. To Elijah and the 7,000. All his group out there, Jezebel and all their fine, fancy tang, fangs, angles and things they had out there. That was a nut. To that 7,000 never bowed their knee to Bala. And so was Elijah a nut to them. See, the same thing. We find out in the days of Herod, John was a nut. See? And Herod was a nut also. The world had one. All right? In the days of Jesus, he was a, 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 a fool to the, to the world. See? To Pilate. The Pilate was a nut also to turn him down. That's right. See? He wasn't threatened. He had an opportunity. But when he had his opportunity to, to accept it, he was some kind of a clown, some kind of a trick, some kind of a magic rabbit to bring him out of a hat you know, or something. He said, oh, I would see you do some tricks you know, or something like that. He was a nut himself, see? He had a chance to receive it, but he didn't. The Sadducees also, and the Pharisees, was the same thing in that day. They're not accepting Paul, the one that said he'd become a fool to the world, see? But the church has its nuts, too, see? And the world has its nuts. Christ has his, see? Now, whose are you? The only way you can always say, oh, how do I know this is right, Brother Branham? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, the Word still is Him. So if we're threaded with that, see, though we, though we be enough to the, the world, if we're threaded in Christ's words, and Christ showing us what he, He's pulling together, He's pulling His church together, let them raise and do what they want to. Now, Jesus in Matthew 24, 24 said that these two uh, groups would be supposed in the last days to deceive the very elected, if possible. The people still, the people sometimes at Pentecost, the uh, outcomers from Pentecost, you see. When they organize and go over there in those groups like that, and you come away from it, see, the Bible said that it would deceive the very elected if it was possible, see. The very elected, that's the ones that's elected to do this. The one, see, the bull, don't come and say, oh, there's, there, there's a nut, you see. See, he's got to be, he's got, when the, the, when the threads was cut in the bowl, it's got to be cut in the nut the same way. See what I mean? It's got to fit. See? And the elected, therefore, see, it won't tighten up with anything else. It's just got to come to Christ, you see. It's the only thing that'll fit. See? And that's where we stand today. Thanks be to, to God. <laughs> All right. Now we find out also that the, the world has their nut. And you know, uh, so much could be said. We haven't the time to say it, of course. But just, uh, just one thought to you. I know it's just fine little a bunch of ladies that sang over there a few minutes ago. Well, I wish I had that song. Get that on tape for me, will you? These songs. When you all sing here, make up the song sometime. I'll pay you for the tape. <laughs> I like to have it. See, that is beautiful. That real sweet worship like that. Now, you know, there was a... a uh, the young, uh, the women of today, the they, Christ, what so-called Christian, the women who, who go to church, they, they wanted uh, uh, something to, to, uh, to satisfy. They know that they, uh, they wasn't getting it just going to church, but they want to maintain their testimony just the same. You see? They want to hold their testimony. Now, I'm Methodist, Baptist, I'm, I'm Christian, you see. They want to strip their clothes off of them. They want to wear shorts. Mm -hmm. Bikinis or what you call them, all these things. See, they, they wanted to do these things. They wanted to have a haircut like man and, and, and do these things. And um, so they they wanted to do that. See, and yet, uh, did you ever think why they did? Jesus said them to his spirits will be so close in to see the elected. That has to come to pass. See, see. So they wanted to. Uh, they didn't get a, a human has to worship. You have to worship something. It's just in you to worship. So a human has to worship something. So they had no worship in their church. So God raised them up a nut. Elvis Presley. Yeah. Pat Boone. Yeah. They still hold their testimony. Elvis Presley, a Pentecostal. Pat Boone, the Church of Christ. See? 
are absolutely nuts. To fulfill Jesus' words, you would be supposed to see the very elected apostle still maintain sing hymns on Sunday and rock and rolls on Monday. See? To us, that's a, that's a nut. See? It, it really is. Now, but you see, in there, you had some fine women also that wanted to act like ladies. They had decency in them. They wanted to be what Christ wants them to be. So he sends a person along with a message that, as to that church that they belong to is foolish. He becomes a nut. But you see what it is? It fits just exactly. When you talk about long hair and looking like a lady and dressing like a lady and acting like a lady, instead of standing like these girls this morning, watching a little girl there, her eyes looked heavenly, heavenly and glassy as she looked up like that, singing something in her heart. Watch them here as them young ladies sing. I thought, oh, God, what if, if uh, a Hollywood star could, uh, could get that in their heart? That they'd be the same thing, see? But what is it? Why did they go that way? You couldn't pull one of them girls in Hollywood. If you give her $10,000 a day, she wouldn't go. Why? She's threaded different. She's exactly right. She's threaded different. That's right. You couldn't pull a Leo, <laughs> Gene, and then into some organization. Why? Couldn't pull you fellows into one. Why? You're threaded different. See? So if you're threaded, there's got to be a nut going on to hold that together. Isn't it right? See? That's complete. Thanks be to God, like the little Dutchman said, part of nuts. If you take them out, it becomes a bunch of junk. What do you got? A bunch of denominationalism, a bunch of poor formalism, no Christ in it at all, no word in it at all, just a bunch of creeds and so forth. And what have you got? Take the nut out, you got a bunch of junk. That's right. Nothing in the world but firewood. Something that's waiting for the blazes and punishments of God to judge and to burn up it someday. So I'm thankful this morning to fit right in up here. <laughs> Where you might be an odd person on this side of the river. Even some of your people might think that you are odd. I know they do. I've had letters from them. That said you were odd. You were different. What in the world happened to you? I just chose this little thing to say to you this morning. Sure, you're a nut. That's right, but I'm glad to be one. For if I'm not tight with this word, then I'm young. <laughs> I'll just be a nut for crying. Yes. I get letters from many of your people. Some of them come by and say, Do you know what happened? What? This odd guy. <laughs> So and so went up there and done so and so. I said, wait, just a minute. <laughs> Depends on what you're wound on. <laughs> so may the Lord Jesus Christ, the shepherd of the flock, ever keep your heart so wound and him that when the great shepherd does appear, we'll appear with him. Can we pray? <laughs> Heavenly Father, seeing that time has run out, and I'm just uh, rushed. Such a lovely, sweet bunch of Christians. And such a rude text. But in the room the other day, thinking of what I'd seen on letters and what I'd heard people say, when I, your little servant sure asked me to come up and, and visit them in a fellowship of the little flock, uh, this rude text of being a nut, I, I thought I'd use that so I could get the, the thought over to them. They, they would understand what I think, too. We have become a fool like Paul to the world. But yet, Lord, we want to be so tightened to you and your word that when the rapture comes, we, know it. we want to be with it, Lord. So help us to ever have our hearts knitted and bound together in the love of Christ. Bless Brother Leo, Brother Gene, and Brother Dalton, and all these fine men and these lovely women in here hearing their testimonies, happy, happy, contented, walk into the room up there where one that's paralyzed. And to see the smiles, no wonder our brother Leo said it's a bit of sunshine to walk up here, no wonder. To see even when the man, not even a bit of relation to her, nothing but concern that they'd take her trailer and make it so she could be happy. See, Lord, the thread works just right. Walk into that home and see someone who really could be grouchy and, and fussy and nasty because it, that they're not out and able to run and dance and, and cut up like many women, but she's happy to be here with her kind. 
and to be here with the Word of God, where it can be preached, and not any creeds tacked to it, just truly unadulterated Word of God. The worship in spirit, come in a little place like this, it's a little trailer where we meet together, and it's the church, wherever two or three are assembled, I'm in their midst. We know you're here, Lord, and we worship you and we praise you. I pray, God, that you'll keep the sickness away from them. Keep the enemy across the river. May this great exodus, it may be in a minor form, but, Lord, someday it's going to grow. And I pray, Lord, that this little exodus here, that you, you will be with them as you did with Moses and them as they crossed the, the Jordan and Joshua as he went into the promised land. And I pray that you will help them, Lord, and keep their hearts genuine, true to you. And bless them as he keeps the word. And may they live long, happy lives. And someday, if we're around here, Lord, living on earth, when you come, may there come a shout from this side of the branch out there. And the church go up. Man of Lord. Because somebody wasn't, was foolish enough to the world to become a nut. To hold it together, Lord, until you come. Then... As John of old, in the days gone by, as the little ladies and sing, we were separated, and how he had to be alone. But when he did, the little church that he had drawn together, when he seen Jesus, he said, Now, my work is over. He increases. I decrease. Father, I pray that you'll ever keep us happy and healthy. May we meet many times more upon the earth, and loving and serving you. May thy divine blessings rest upon this service, upon the services that shall follow, and may we all live such in this life, in the life to come. We'll have eternal life in the great age to come, over in that great millennium reign, where we shall see him and look upon his face and see him. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you, my people. I am so sorry that I... Uh, uh, to, I, I, I took a text, something like that. It's such a rude thing. But you get what I meant. So, when anyone uh, they say you're odd, you know why you're odd, don't you? God bless you, Brother Leo.